Students in First Nations communities are scoring below the national average, particularly in math and science. The traditional classroom approach may not be engaging students, which leads to lower grades and more dropouts. The issue is of concern to parents, educators, and teachers alike. Lalash is a typical northern Saskatchewan community in most ways. Students face similar challenges to their counterparts in other northern and aboriginal communities. The question is why, and what can be done to take on these challenges? A group of students from Lalash Community School might be on to something. It all started with a simple curiosity about the environment around them, and an opportunity that presented itself to Lalash school teacher Brian Chappell. We went to Saskatoon and the professors at the University of Saskatchewan made presentations about the Nobel laureates for 2010, I think it was. And, and so my students went down and then we went on tours of different parts of the, the university. We met a group from Centennial School in Saskatoon and they were looking at soils and they were very interested in the soil around the Lalash because apparently the soil here is very susceptible to acidity. And so if acid rain is falling on Lalash, that can affect the vegetation. And, and, uh, and so all of a sudden we just opened up this whole new uh, area of research. The students' curiosity led to a school project that would allow them to work with world-class research scientists in a more active, experiential way than sitting in a classroom listening to a teacher and taking notes. Not only is the learning opportunity much more hands-on, but it enables the students to explore the environment around them and answer questions they have about the possible presence of acid rain and what could be causing it. Robert Blythe is the Assistant Director of Research at the Canadian Light Source in Saskatoon. He's also the scientist that will work with the students during the phase of the project that takes place at the Light Source facility. Uh, we operate as a national, in fact an international facility, so it's almost odd to say that almost 90% of the science that's done here is not done by our scientists. It's done by people from uh, all around Canada and in fact from all over the world. Um, and one of the groups that we have been reaching out to a lot is high schools. The Canadian Light Source is Canada's national synchrotron facility. A synchrotron is a beam of brilliant light that enables scientists to study the microstructure and chemical properties of materials. Matter can be observed down to an atomic level. This kind of information is useful in a multitude of ways, and each experiment is unique. When a teacher decides that they would like to give this kind of experience to their students, they talk to me and we talk about different ways that students can get involved, the types of projects that they can work with, things like that, and then that teacher builds a team. And we take those students and match them up with a scientist, and then everybody works together to design a project. And then we schedule it and we come down and, and we, we conduct the experiment. So it's very organic, it's very, what are we interested in? What started as a simple question has grown into an exciting project with a wealth of potential benefits. Foremost among those is that it could increase student interest and engagement in science, resulting in higher performance. Alexis St. Pierre is a grade 11 student. She attends the Lalage Community School and is one of the students that is working with the CLS to find out what's going on in her backyard. We are grabbing samples for so we can check in the light beam, I guess, for, to see what's in our soil, to see what's happening with our trees, and to see what's happening with our water and the acid rain and what's it doing to it. If we know what's going on, we could just keep what we're doing, like doing nothing to the environment. But if we find something wrong, we can try and change it so we can make it better. Brian Chapel has worked with the students since the project's inception. He's excited about the possibilities. I think what we're going to find, though, is that the students are really, I think the students are going to begin to think about what they're doing. And they're going to, they're going to stop, stop thinking that I'm here to be told what to learn to, and, and switch to be able to say, I can figure out and I can make a contribution from my own observations, and my, own, my own thought processes and my own reasoning 
and, and come up with some solutions or some ideas about, about what to do with life problems. I'm hoping that would be the real outcome of the, pro the project. The students are fortunate to have access to a world-class research facility, and just how Saskatoon ended up as the location for such a facility is a story in itself. Former University of Saskatchewan President Peter McKinnon. In the early 1930s, the university could not meet payroll. The depression, all of the issues associated with that, the university ran out of money. And so the president at that time said to the younger, particularly single faculty members, go away and we'll bring you back when we can afford to pay you again. And one of the young professors was a gentleman by the name of J.W.T. Spinks, an assistant professor of chemistry. Spinks went to Germany for two years and worked in the laboratory of German scientist Gerhard Hertzberg. He returned when the university could afford to pay him. Hertzberg, meanwhile, realized that he had to get out of Germany because of the Nazis and contacted Spinks. Spinks, of course, went to see the president, said, this is a great scientist. Let's bring him to the University of Saskatchewan. That is what happened. Gerhard Hertzberg came to the University of Saskatchewan, was a great physicist at this university, developed the strength, the academic strength, brought in excellent people and began the chain in motion that led to the University of Saskatchewan successfully competing for the largest science project in modern Canadian history, which is the Canadian Light Source Synchrotron. How the Synchrotron ended up in Saskatchewan is a good example of adversity leading to opportunity, the proximity of a science facility that brings together academia, industry and community members is ideal for a province like Saskatchewan. Likewise, northern students like those from Lalage face adversity that is reflected in lower grades in math and science, according to statistics. Projects like theirs offer the kids an opportunity to contribute to their community, become more actively engaged with their environment and their studies, and hopefully get higher grades. Back home, the students are taking samples of the environment. They're focusing on three types. Soil samples, a core sample of a tree, and water. The class goes out into the bush and carefully collects and stores material. Once they've gathered enough samples, the next step is to take it to Saskatoon and put it to the test. The light source has provided them with an opportunity to get out of town, I think, do something really different. And uh, I mean, we could, do the, we could do a lot of experiments in the lab, but it's interesting to get out of the classroom, out into the, out into, into the bush, and then down in this big, you know, high-tech, almost, you know, Star Trek kind of technology and do experiments on it. I, mean, I think it's very exciting. It's like science fiction in a way. The students are enthusiastic and engaged. The process of collecting samples and then analyzing them at the synchrotron is much different than the traditional classroom approach, and the students' increased interest in learning is evident. John Tay DeRoche is a grade 12 student at Lalage Community School. He was in the first group of Lalage students to conduct research at the Synchrotron in 2011. He's learned a lot from the process. This project basically, you know, opened my eyes. Like, I didn't think that, you know, stuff like this was affecting our environment, you know, within the northern Saskatchewan. But now it's, you know, all these little factories or mining plants in uh, Alberta. I didn't think that they have an effect over here, so that sort of opened my eyes of the realization of how everything can affect, you know, us or whatever. The students are in Saskatoon. They've got some theories. Now it's time to conduct experiments and see if their suspicions are correct. The initial project was, well, let, let's have a look at possible effects of acid rain on the environment. And we've ended up going down a slightly different route because they brought a, a number of different samples that they themselves collected. They had, they had soil, 
they had uh, what, what you call musk egg soil and having been up there on a different project and, and gone through into the musk egg soil, I can tell you it's not very pleasant, um, they brought uh, tree cores, so wood samples they collected themselves. And one interesting sample which was um, uh, a section of a log that showed a very interesting ring structure because of course every tree tells a story and the history of the last 90 years in that environment is written in the rings of this tree. And a sample that size is usually very difficult to do on a synchrotron. So as it turns out, the beam line could do it. So they put that in the beam. And on that sample, so on the log, they found manganese. And it was the only sample where the, where the, the biggest signal was from manganese. And there's no manganese in the soil. There's no manganese in the water. So the question is then, where's the manganese coming from? By having to try to figure out what their findings mean, the students are in a leadership role in their research. This is new for them, and the adults too. The presence of manganese in their samples was unexpected and leaves more questions than answers, given the limited time frame of the project. But as Tracy Walker points out, this is often the true nature of scientific research. Science in schools, particularly labs, feel like following a cookbook following a recipe. You're given instructions, you do what you're supposed to do, you follow step by step, and you know whether or not you have the right answer or not, because you kind of know what you're supposed to get before you go into it. This is different because we are deliberately pushing the envelope. We want to try and ask questions and learn something that is new, that has not been done before. And that kind of excites the kids, but at the same time it's also kind of intimidating a little bit. With the experiment complete, the students now have to present their findings to an assembled group of scientists and another visiting group of students from Ontario. The students work on their presentation and even get a visit from local news media who are covering their story. It's the final day of the students' visit to the Canadian Light Source in Saskatoon and time to present their findings. Alexis and Nicholas take their places. The presentation goes smoothly, and afterwards, Alexis and Nicholas field questions from the audience. The students have completed their experiment and are getting ready to head home. So how was it presenting for a group of scientists? Nerve-wracking. It was very... But they don't know us, so it was okay, I guess. <laughs> yeah. more nervous Practicing. Yeah, then doing it in front of people. The experience has been a success for everyone involved. By connecting science to meaningful everyday questions about their immediate environment, the students have learned that they can have a deeper understanding of the world around them. And their studies have value in more ways than one. We're doing some really high level research with these students, really we are. Not everything has to be at that level. It can be as simple as walking outside and observing differences and making connections. You know, it's, it's experiencing the learning and learning by doing. Instead of learning about inquiry, learn through inquiry. These are going to be the scientists of the future and it's part of our job to go out and find them, get them interested in science earlier, and get them in here 10, 15 years time. So maybe in 20 years time, there'll be uh, somebody sitting on the other side of the desk giving an interview to my successor down the line who might be a First Nations person, might be one of the people in the building today. That would make me very proud. <laughs>